We are so glad that you're here to celebrate the resurrection with Je of Jesus Christ today. And this is a great day to celebrate, isn't it? If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. We're going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus today, the resurrection that requires a response. The resurrection that requires a response. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would. If you were here with us on Friday, you know this is just part of the whole Easter weekend. And uh, on Friday, we did what we call the cross service. And uh, many of you have seen it before. We've done it now for uh, over 17 years since I I've been here. And um, I think I've built 100 crosses in the last 25 years. They're all about this size. And uh, I keep saying that as I get older, I'm going to make them smaller and smaller. But that's not how it's working out. They're getting bigger and bigger, it seems. But I never cease to be amazed at how uh, the cross draws people to Jesus in a powerful unmistakable way. And so we celebrate that on Good Friday. And of course, Good Friday is named Good Friday because of the incredible good that comes out of the cross into our lives. But I want you to imagine with me for just a moment what would happen if Jesus had died on the cross, been buried, and never came out of that tomb, did not rise from the dead. I want you to imagine for just a few moments a world in which a proclaimed Messiah and a proclaimed Savior was crucified, was put to death, but was not able to fulfill the promise to rise again. Imagine a spiritual life trying to get to God, but having no real way of getting there and no one who could lead them there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter about the resurrection of Jesus written to a group of people who often doubted the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the, the mindset was, I'm not sure he rose from the dead. Uh, if he did, I'm not sure how important the resurrection is anyway. And we're going to answer some questions about the resurrection today. Please stand with me as we read God's Word today and as we talk about the resurrection. By the way, as you find this text in your passages in the Bible uh, you need to keep in mind that everything about the Christian faith is built on uh, historical, uh, archaeological evidence as well as prophetic evidence that these things have actually taken place in the way that they have. When we hold the Bible, when we read it, we don't read it as though it is a fantastic story of stories. It's not just a book of fables, and it's not something that someone said that we think might have happened. It's something that is been validated and verified in every possible way. And when we read God's Word, we're, we're understanding of that. But I also know that there are those who doubt some things about the Bible, and there are those that doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I need you to know today that Jesus was patient with people who doubted the resurrection of Jesus himself. He came to Thomas in the upper room and showed him the wounds in his hands and side. Uh, Paul was patient with a group of believers, some of them new believers, who were concerned about the reality of the resurrection. That's the background that I'm reading from as he writes this letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished. That's a, a real strong word with a final stop to it. They have perished and there's nothing else. And then he says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. One translation says most miserable. Paul's making a clear argument, a clear statement about what would it be like if Christ had not risen from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would use this text and the texts surround what we've just read to speak to us today about the resurrection and what it means to us. I ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. So they're asking, did it happen? Why does it matter? I suspect that many of you in the room today 
believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We had a phenomenal worship experience where people were singing about the name of Jesus as though he were alive, and he is alive. We were singing about him as though he rose from the dead, and he did rise from the dead. And nevertheless, there are times and there are people who sometimes doubt the resurrection of Jesus, and it affects their faith in so many different ways. And I want to celebrate in such a way that also points out the validity of his resurrection from the dead. And that's what Paul's doing. Using the word if, he's delivering a set of conditional propositions to the people reading the letter to us today. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then this is the result. He says that at least five different times as we work through that text together. I'm just going to throw all five on the screen for just a moment to show you how it impacts life and how it impacts eternity. Because if there's no resurrection, then we face five insurmountable problems that no religion, no person, no way can we get around in any way. Number one, if there is no resurrection, then Christ was merely human. A good human being, but human, not supernatural, and God is not personal. Number two, but if Christ is not risen from the dead, then we have no truth and no basis for truth and no basis for faith. Everything the Old Testament says about what would have happened to Christ, everything Jesus said he would do, everything the disciples said he did do would be invalid and you would have no reason for faith at all. Number three, if Christ had not risen from the dead, then forgiveness becomes impossible. Paul literally says that if Christ be not raised, you're still in your sins. No one has ever, nor will anyone ever be able to be an intermediary between God and man but Jesus. And if Jesus did not rise from the dead, he failed in that mission. Number four, eternity, hope, and purpose do not exist. If this life is the only life we have, and I love the New King James Version that says, we are of all men most miserable. Sometimes life is miserable and hard, and if this is all we have, then we may be of all men most miserable. Then number five, there is no victory over life's greatest enemies, including death. Death is final. There's nothing beyond it, nothing you can do about it. Death is the end. Now, there are a lot of reasons that we want the resurrection to be true. But the reality is the resurrection is true. And Paul is writing to help us understand that it is. Even modern doubters are won by the overwhelming evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Some of you know the name of Lee Strobel, a fantastic speaker, a great author who doubted the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, when his wife came to faith and he decided to, to disprove the basis of her faith, and so he did extensive study into the resurrection of Jesus, interviewing people uh, from all over, from various fields of science and archaeology. And he came to the conclusion after 700 hours of research that Christ did rise from the dead. And he wrote a series of books called The Case for Christ, The Case for Easter, The Case for Resurrection. Many of you know a guy named Josh McDowell who wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Josh McDowell also was a doubter and he was an intellectual. And his goal, his life goal, was to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. And in his research, he came to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead and put his faith and trust in Christ. He actually wrote this text, this statement I'm about to read you. He said, after more than 700 years of studying this subject, 700 hours, excuse me, of studying this subject, and thoroughly investigating its foundation, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus is one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of men, or it is the most fantastic fact of history. And he, of course, arrived at that place of saying, this is the most amazing fact in history, and I put my faith in Christ. That is, that is the testimony of Josh McDowell. Now, I want you to think about resurrection for just a few moments. There probably are medical personnel in the room, and so resurrection is, is literally bringing someone back from the dead. Now, whenever that happens in modern science and modern medicine and modern history, we find out about it. We hear about it, don't we? It makes the headline. When's the last time you had a headline blazoned across your screen or across a paper or magazine article that said, 
A man dead three days has come back to life. When's the last time you read that? You haven't read that. Most medical personnel will say that after 20 to 30 minutes of someone whose heart has ceased, who has ceased breathing, they call them dead. And no more emergency treatment is given. In fact, we have on record the, the longest time a person that has been without vital signs and yet came back to life was 80 minutes. In the case of a woman who drowned literally in frozen water and cold water, and they got her body out, they resuscitated her after 80 minutes, and she came back to life. There are unconfirmed reports of people that have been dead for three and a half hours. Someone else said that they had read of someone that had been dead eight hours, but no confirmation because when a person dies, their body immediately goes into decomposition. Autom automatically, the enzymes of the body and the internal parts of the body begin to decompose, and the body quickly, quickly becomes unable in any way to be resuscitated. And yet, Jesus, after three days in the tomb, came back to life. Now, three days confirmed by Roman soldiers whose job it was to put him to death, who sealed the tomb, and their job again was to make sure no one tampered with the body. These men knew when someone was dead. It was their job to do that. These men knew when someone would be buried, that they would be buried securely. These men knew how to do that. And yet on the third day, when they came out to find the body of Jesus, his body was nowhere to be found, which prompted the cries from the women and the disciples that he's risen from the dead. We're dealing with something that's archaeologically and scientifically and in every way impossible, and yet it's proven that these eyewitnesses saw Jesus Christ come back from the dead. So if someone rises from the dead after three days, it might be a good idea to think about listening to him and following him and learning from him. His name is Jesus Christ. So today I want to talk to you about the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul, as he says, if Christ be not raised, all these things are what you have the result of. No resurrection. But if he's raised... And he has. Here's what you have. Keep reading in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Paul continues on, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep, for since by a man came death, by a man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. That's an impact. That's a result of the resurrection. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, and after that those who are Christ at his coming. And then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, all these things are very encouraging to me because I know I won't live forever, and I know you won't live forever, and I know if we want to live beyond this life, we have to have someone that's able to overcome death and sin and all the other things we have to overcome, and that name is Jesus. So I want you today to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it does do for you and how it is powerful in your life. I want you to see how practical it is. I, I want you to know that his resurrection is not just a fact. It is a basis for faith and even how you believe and what you believe him for. Number one, if Christ rose from the dead, it demonstrates that God is powerful and personal. Powerful and personal. Now notice how Paul words the negative side of that. He says, but if there is no resurrection from the dead... Not even Christ has been raised. He uses the word Christ specifically. In this case, not Jesus, but Christ. Now, what Paul is saying is, not even the Messiah that God sent us was raised. Now, the very fact that God sent us the Messiah says that God is personal. And the fact that he would allow him to be born of a virgin, walk on the planet, interact with us, perform miracles, raise the dead himself, and then finally be raised on the third day, said that he's powerful. Without a Messiah, you have a God who may be all-knowing, all-wise, but seems so distant, so far, that we can't know him well. But the Bible says that Jesus came to show us who God really was. 
who he is and how he works. And if Christ was not raised from the dead, then God has failed to explain himself to us. But because he did rise from the dead, we know we have a Messiah and we can believe that God is able to rescue mankind if he rose. And it tells us that God is real and God is personal. Now think about the verses that you'll remember very easily. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is making Jesus personal and powerful in that he sent him. What about John chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And and in that writing, John, the apostle is saying, Jesus helped us know who God was. He helped us know how personal God is. In verse 18, John goes on and says uh, that that no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So Jesus has come as Messiah. He's come in a personal way, in a powerful way. He's explained and manifested to us who God is. So that means basically the fact that Jesus rose from the dead means that God is personal. He's powerful. It means that Jesus came and he identified with us, and he connected with us. He loved us. He knows us. He cares for us, and he did all that and then rose from the dead to show us that God is powerful and personal. Without Jesus rising from the dead and without Jesus even coming, your God is distant and far away, and you're unable to approach him. All the world religions today, apart from Christianity, involve that, a distant, cold deity that has no way to connect us, no way to explain life to him. But God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus so you could know him and know God. But when Jesus rose from the dead, we knew God was powerful and God was personal. And the resurrection helps you know that all the days of your life. Secondly, the resurrection says that truth is reliable. Truth is reliable. In verse 17 and 14, and 14 as well, Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. And your faith also is vain. He goes on and says, your faith is worthless. So writing to a group of people who have belief in Jesus, he said, if you don't embrace the resurrection of Jesus, then everything you call faith has a weakness to it. It's it's worthless. Paul literally says, even what I preach is meaningless if Christ is not risen. Because what we preach has no power to change anything. If God could not raise Jesus from the dead, he can't help you with the problems that you have in life, the difficult challenges that you face. And he can't help you after you finish your life here on earth, after you die, because if he couldn't raise Jesus, he couldn't raise you either. And you have no basis for faith and no firm foundation for following God. Now, some of my uh, my adult kids these days are, are buying houses and when they buy houses, they often call dad. And uh, dad is uh, the secondary inspector. We always have to call an inspector to inspect the houses. But I have to come over and I have to check it out, right? And uh, on all, almost every one of these homes that my kids have purchased, uh, the foundation becomes a question. Is the foundation solid? Is the foundation not moving? Is it, is it, is it firm? Uh, we have people come out that are specialists and they measure the height of the foundation over here and the height of the foundation over there and they make sure that it's not moving down a hill or it's not tilting one way or another. There's no cracks on the walls. There's no crack in the doors. They're all aligned perfectly. And we do that because we don't want to buy a house and live in a house, a temporary dwelling place that will only be in for a few years. We don't want to do that if it's not got a great foundation. And we should make sure it has a strong foundation. You need to make sure you have a great foundation for faith. Because when your faith is challenged, and when the world that so vehemently cries out against your Christian faith, you need to know that you're standing on solid ground. That you have a basis for saying what you say about Jesus, and that you have a basis for believing that he can fulfill the word that he gave us. Paul said if it weren't for the resurrection, we don't have a message We don't have anything to say to you, and you have no reason to believe at all. But because Jesus rose from the dead, you can have absolute 
confidence. The resurrection says that our beliefs are reliable and trustworthy in every way. Did you know that when Jesus came uh, and was born of a virgin, and, uh, and you know the whole Christmas story as it unfolds, that it was preceded by prophecy. We, we all know about the prophecies of Christ. And we all love to talk about how he fulfilled every one of those prophecies of the Messiah coming. But many of us may not know that some of the prophecies of Jesus prophesy his resurrection as well. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, the scripture says the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, speaking about the scourging of the cross. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, specifically talking about the cross, it says he will see his offspring, and then it says he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In other words, prophecy says that God would prolong the days of Jesus, that this death as a guilt offering, as a man dying on the cross, was not the end of Jesus' life, that his life would be prolonged. So prophecy tells us about the resurrection of Jesus, just like it tells us about the incarnation of Jesus. And our faith is reliable because the resurrection was fulfilled that was prophesied. We also know the resurrection was real because of eyewitness accounts. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and, uh, and, and read all of the numbers of people who saw Christ alive from the grave. Did you know that hundreds of people saw Christ risen from the dead. It wasn't just Mary and the disciples. It was hundreds of people. Paul wrote and said, some of them are alive even to this day. In other words, you can validate what I write by those eyewitnesses who saw Jesus Christ after the third day alive and well. Now, you know what happens in society when eyewitnesses see a crime. When eyewitnesses see a crime in our society, it's considered validation enough to prosecute the criminal that a person saw them commit a crime towards. We put people into capital punishment situations. We execute people who others have seen as eyewitnesses them commit a murder. We put a lot of weight in eyewitnesses' accounts, don't we? If you see something, then you are, you are someone that's absolutely certain that you saw what you saw and you convince others, I saw it. And so it happened. Eyewitness accounts are important. Just because you and I weren't there 2,000 years ago doesn't mean no one saw Jesus risen from the dead. Hundreds of people saw him from the dead. You have prophecy fulfilled. You have eyewitness accounts. You have changes in the disciples' lives. These disciples, so fearful at the cross, after the resurrection became on fire for Jesus, they would not quit talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Paul was in prison several times for talking about the resurrection from the dead. What could explain the changes in these men's lives other than the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? You look at the subsequent history of the New Testament church and the move of the church from where it began at Pentecost in Jerusalem, to spread throughout the world. And the only explanation is Jesus Christ is alive. He's real. He's life-transforming to every single one of us, and that's why we keep talking about that. Your faith is firm. But then you also have this. You have an empty tomb. The reality of these disciples running to this tomb and finding the tomb where Jesus was buried completely empty is not lost on us. This is the picture of the garden tomb that we took when we were in Jerusalem last year. Someone might say, well, there are two different sites where the tomb of Jesus must have been, and we're not sure which one it was. And my response to that is, you're absolutely right. We're not sure exactly which tomb it was. But the debate about which tomb that Jesus was buried in, uh, we're not sure about. But Jesus did rise again, and there's no debate about that. Amen. What you and I need to know today is that he's alive he died, he was buried, and when they came to find him in the tomb, he was gone. And then he appeared again, and he was alive, and hundreds saw him. Because of that, you can believe your faith. You can believe the basis of the Scripture. It's reliable, and that everything the Scripture says is reliable because it's reliable in this place. It's dependable. It's true. We have knowledge of the Christ and all that he did, all that he said, and the Bible brings us to Christ, but Christ himself fastens us to Scripture because he rose. We have truth. It's real. 
That's number two. Number three, and you'll love this one, sin is forgiven. In verse 17, Paul says, if Christ is not dead, if Christ is not risen, then you are still in your sins. In other words, there's no other basis for the forgiveness of sin other than Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. If he didn't rise, then he died just like any other man might die on a cross. And we still search for a Savior. We still need someone to atone for our sins and to overcome sin and death. Can you imagine a life without forgiveness? You probably have experienced some periods of life without forgiveness. You know, we carry the weight of our sin on us. We feel the weight of it. We feel the weight of our offense at somebody else's hands too and things we've said and done to others. We, we, we are weighted down by that. But it's not an easy life to live when you're living in a place of unforgiveness. We have all kinds of regrets and separation because of our inability to forgive others. We walk sometimes far from God because we don't seek His forgiveness. It's very real for many of us. And the reality is that unforgiveness will always be a part of our lives if Jesus had not risen from the dead. Years ago, I heard of a most unusual term and it was really almost a horrific term. It's called the sin eater. It described a medieval practice years ago where sin eaters were individuals who made their money by eating a meal that was served on the chest of a dead family member. And someone had called the sin eater to come eat that meal and in some way pronounced that the sins had been forgiven on the basis of the sin eater eating their sin. Sounds horrific, doesn't it? Doesn't sound like something I'd recommend. But it was an actual practice. And the whole idea behind it was somebody needs to pay for sins. And since we don't know who that is, and we don't know how it would take place, we'll hire the sin eater to come and eat this meal and ceremoniously consume those sins and remove them. Now, when I first read that, I thought, well, the medieval people didn't have the best ideas, right? And then I thought, they may have better ideas than we sometimes have. At least those people knew that sin was a barrier between ourselves and God. At least they knew that something had to pay for sins that we'd committed against God and against each other. At some point, they realized there has to be a solution to this. This is the only one that we happen to have. But when Jesus Christ came, the Bible says that Jesus became sin on our behalf. That he actually paid for the sins on the cross that he was the guilt offering that God placed on the cross to pay for our sin and consume it. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Man, what a powerful thing. But if Jesus had not risen from the dead, then all of that would say he wasn't strong enough to overcome sin, he wasn't strong enough to overcome death. One of the greatest things I enjoy as a pastor is walking through the cross service and being able to point to this cross. And as I point to the cross, talk about the whole history of the blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice began in the Garden of Eden, as you may know, where Adam and Eve sinned and God slew an innocent animal and covered them with its skins. And then it began uh, further with Abraham and Aaron. And then it went on even up to the time of Jesus' day when the sacrifices were still being made in the temple in Jerusalem. And until Jesus Christ died on the cross, those sacrifices continued on. The Old Testament sacrificial system was innocent blood shed for guilty to pay for sin. When Jesus Christ came, John the Baptist said, the first to recognize him as who he was, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What a statement. Jesus lived that perfect life he died on the cross as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and he consumed our sin in doing so. God buried him. He was buried. God allowed him to be buried and rose again the third day to overcome the sin and promise forgiveness. Because Jesus rose from the dead, you and I can know that our sins are forgiven, that we are no longer in our sins because of Jesus Christ. Apart from him, 
What would we do with all of our foolish actions and statements and, and things that we've done over the years? Where would the thief on the cross be if Jesus Christ had not forgiven? Where would Peter be who denied Christ three times if Jesus had not risen from the dead? But he rose from the dead, which means that we have forgiveness of sin. Somebody in the room say amen. I am glad that we have forgiveness of sin. So sin is forgiven. Number four, eternity is secured. In verse 18 and 19 is that verse. It says that those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we're of all men most to be pitied. As a pastor, I do a lot of funerals, and sometimes I'm asked to do funerals of people who had no faith, who had no hope of eternal life. And I can tell you some of the saddest services I've ever been in have been those kinds of services. Not necessarily because of what was said, but because of what everybody knows in the room. This person had no faith. They had no hope beyond death. And I, I can watch families walk by a casket. I can see them and interacting with them and know this is the saddest of all sad. To live life with all its highs and lows and then to come to a full stop and say there's nothing better than that. There's not going to improve. There's no more hope, no more meaning than whatever that person had. This is it. Now in Paul's day, when he talked about if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we're of all men most miserable, he was referring to the difficulty of living the Christian life. People gave their lives for the testimony of Christ. Sometimes they lost their families for that. It was a tough time to live. And Paul was simply saying, life is not going to be always great. We need to have something that has more meaning and hope beyond this life. And eternity is what Jesus Christ secured when he rose from the dead. I'm glad for this. As much meaning and purpose I, as I have in this life, I'm glad that everything I've done goes ahead of me and I have greater purpose and meaning after I die on this planet to be with Jesus. The Bible says to be absent from body to be, is to be present with Christ because he has gone ahead of us and he's prepared the way. I love the resurrection because it says, I will live again and you will live again if your faith is in Jesus Christ. Apart from that, your life will be just a series of ups and downs. Satisfied sometimes with things you gain, dissatisfied with the emptiness of them and have no hope of meaning beyond the grave without Christ's resurrection and your faith in him. And then finally, I want to share with you that the resurrection means that death is abolished. Death is abolished. The Bible says, then comes the end when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. You know, this is where the resurrection becomes extremely practical today to you. There may be some of you today that say, you know, I'm not really concerned about death. That's a long way into the future. But there will be a defining moment in your life where death becomes real to you. At some point, you'll feel it in your life. Or someone close to you, someone that you love is close to death or has been threatened by death. And all of a sudden, it's incredibly important to know about eternity, about life beyond the grave, about the fact that someone has abolished death, overcome death. When Jesus rose from the dead, he removed the threat of death for every single one of us. Now, there are some in the room that say, you know, I, I don't trust Christ. I'm not putting my faith in him. I, I'll take my chances. And, and I just want to say to you today, I don't like your odds. I don't like the odds that you're bringing to, trying to bring to your favor because if you're not powerful enough to overcome death, there's no one else that's overcome death. Only Jesus rose from the dead after the third day. Uh, if, you, if, you don't have, if you have a religion, it's not going to be enough to rise you from the dead. Nothing else will raise you from the dead except the man who did rise from the dead, Jesus Christ. I don't like your odds without Jesus. With Jesus, I love the idea that you will have life after death because death is abolished. And it all comes down to someone that goes before us who's waiting on the other side. Christ has gone to the Father. He's waiting on the other side. Now, you may not need this truth today, but there will be a day when you need this truth more than anything you can possibly imagine. And on that day, you will say, thank God for raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank God there is life after this one here. You know, as you think about the cross of Jesus, amen.
As you think about the cross of Jesus, as you think about the tomb, as you think about the resurrection, I want to ask you today how solidly, how firmly is your faith resting on him, on that person who died, who was buried, who rose, who will come again. Because today, when you see the resurrection of Jesus is real, and you haven't embraced him in the past, today is that day. On Good Friday, Friday night, I gave an invitation to people after they saw the cross raised. And I'm, I'm so thankful for how God was moving in the hearts of people. And they were just ready to put their faith and trust in Christ. There were so many, as we mentioned a few moments ago. It's kind of always the way it worked. One of the ways that we have prepared for people is to pray for them by name. And there may be many in this room today. You've been prayed for by name. People have prayed that you might know Christ in a very real way. And it may be at this moment that you need to make a decision to put your faith and trust in Christ. And I want to lead you to do that right now. I'm going to lead us in a prayer right where we are. And then I'm going to ask you to respond to me, to actually text me at the end of the service and say, I put my faith and trust in Christ. What's next? And I want to help you in what's next. But right now, I want to help you put your faith and trust in Christ. I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment that I invite anyone to pray with me. That prayer will say something like this. It'll say, Lord Jesus, I know that you came, that you lived the life that the Bible describes, that you died on the cross. I believe that you were buried and that you rose again the third day and that you offer eternal life. And today I want to accept the gift of eternal life. I want you to forgive me of my sin. I want you to give me this gift. I put my faith firmly in you. I choose to follow you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer like that. And if you want to pray that prayer today, I want you to join me right now. You can pray silently while I pray out loud. I'm going to give you time to do that. You can whisper your prayer. Uh, you can say it however you want to say it. You can say it out loud. But as you do that, just know Christ who knows you well will hear your prayer and respond to you should you choose to put your faith in Christ. Would you bow with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these in the room. And over these next few moments, I want to give space for them to make the decision to allow you to be the Lord and Savior of their lives, to believe all of the claims made about you and that you did rise again from the dead. And Lord, as they, as they prepare to ask you to give them the gift of eternal life, I pray, Lord, that you'll give them the faith they need, the trust they need to do that very thing. Hear them as they pray. I ask this in Jesus' name. And with your heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm going to say these, these words, walk you through this prayer for those that want to put their faith in Christ. Just say these words to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, today I know that Jesus Christ came to the earth. I believe he lived the perfect life. And I believe he died on the cross. I know he was buried. And today I believe he rose from the dead. And I ask you, Lord, to give me this gift of eternal life that Jesus has secured. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and give me the gift that you promised. Lead me in the way I'm to walk. Help me to put my faith firmly on your truth. And I pray that you will confirm in my life that you are there. Thank you for the gift of salvation. I ask this in Jesus' name. And let everybody in the room say amen. amen. There may be some of you that prayed that prayer today. It would be my greatest desire to be able to interact with you. And if you would just take your phone and text the word TALK to 63566. Text the word TALK to 63566. If you pray that prayer, or if you're a guest today, text the word GUEST to that same number, 63566. Now, if you've prayed to accept Christ today, on your way out, I have a gift for you that I want you to receive. There are stations at each of our exit doors, and uh, just show them that you've texted me, and they'll give you this uh, gift bag with uh, scriptures in it and some next steps in it. But I, I just want to be of help to you if you put your faith and trust in Christ today. Now, are you glad for the resurrection of Jesus today? Would you just stand and give an ovation to the Lord who has forgiven us, who has given us eternal life?
Father, today I'm so grateful for the life that we have in Jesus. And I ask you today, just be very real to each one of us as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter.